I never write, but I have been reading so many stories on here, so I figure I would tell one of my own. Background, I live in a small town, but in the popular fancy neighborhood that everyone made sure to hit up on Halloween night because of full-size candy bars. My family lives on a dead end and in the deepest part of this small neighborhood, which contains my aunt's house, sisters, and mine. My house was the oldest house as well as the first house to be built before the whole neighborhood. Before it was all woods as far as I know. My aunt is very creative and artistic, so she turned this trail in her backyard to a secret garden. It was full of old angel statues, old bird fountain a bench, and just a lot of woods. Me and my cousins always played in these woods when we were kids until we heard the old man. Note by the garden there was a super old shed made of tin, and it was there before my house I'm guessing. Also about 100 feet away a slab of old busted concrete, the size of another shed covered by a ton of leaves and dirt. Just thought I would add that the beginning I was around 8 or 9 years old, and after school I wanted to go play at my cousin's house like I usually did. So I walked up to the driveway and my older cousin male 12 was playing with a basketball and stopped to ask me if I have heard the old man. I was obviously confused and asked what he was talking about. He then pointed at the secret garden and said listen. So we went quiet and in that instance all you heard was moaning like someone was in pain. After hearing it for over five minutes I ran home as it never stopped. My cousin informed my aunt about the noises we were hearing, and she just thought it was nothing and brushed it off, since we were young and always played pretend in the woods. But the noise never stopped, it would grow louder or be very quiet, but never stopped. The next day my older cousin male 12 had a friend that lived in the next yard over male that had a unique name. He decided to cut through the woods as he usually did to get to my cousin's house, only to be stopped. He heard his name being called through the woods that went further back, and he was there for a few minutes I'm guessing confused. My aunt noticed him the kitchen window had a view of the garden walking out and immediately dropped everything yelling and running to him checking and making sure he was unharmed and okay. Which freaked us out because she didn't believe us about the old man. The neighbor then said someone was calling for him in the woods, groaning his name loud. He ended up getting homeschooled even though his dad was a public school teacher, and he stopped coming over. At my house our woods are connected, and in my backyard we have a huge shop my dad and his friend worked out of. My dad's friend was alone working in a shop with all the shop doors open and began to hear the moaning noise even over the machine equipment. So he walked down the hill to check out the noise and it stopped. He went back to work heard the noise again, and this repeated several times before he just left. Soon after this my aunt freaked out and called the police. The police heard the noise, all I remember is them saying is, we didn't find a body, or anything else after hours of searching our woods. This wouldn't be the first time the police were called either. At some point the groaning stopped, maybe a week or two. When it started back my aunt had called the police again to come and double check. Again, they found nothing. My aunt was most likely terrified and try not to show it. She went around surrounded areas nearby logging company other houses a mile away from the woods to try and get answers if they have heard it or if they are making the noises. Then my aunt started holding prayer groups with women from her church to come and pray over her home. This happened a few times. I remember seeing around nine women in a circle praying and holding hands over the yard for minutes. The moaning stopped and we never played in the secret garden again. I will never know the truth to what we heard. I am in the Navy and at the time of this anecdote, I was part of a security detachment for a freighter off the coast of Iran. It was a few hours into my watch, probably around one on a gun mount, when a small fishing vessel near the horizon starts beaming our ship with a high-powered laser pointer. This is actually a pretty common occurrence in the area, but I reported to my superior to make sure they were aware. About two or three minutes later, I look back over to where the vessel was to check on it, and it's gone. It was the middle of the night in the ocean, but my naked eyes should have picked up the boat with relative ease. 
I put on my night vision goggles and scanned the same area forward of the ship. Nothing. Literally nothing. No vessel, no stars, no horizon, just nothing. I felt like I was tired. Perhaps my night watch was getting to my head. I took off the goggles and did some jumping jacks and push-ups for a few minutes and took another look. That's when I saw it, an impending wall of gray. No start, no beginning, just gray. Fog. Heavy, thick fog thicker than any fog I've ever seen. Within moments every metal surface was coated in mist. I could not see more than twenty or so feet in any direction. It was eerie, the civilians piloting the ship didn't use any horns or anything. We just sailed through the dense cloud. I couldn't even see the water. My only perception of speed was the thick mist moving past me. Luckily, nothing happened. But when you are standing in armed watch on a big freighter near Iran, and waters that have had reports of pirates, and your most important sense is taken away from you. I couldn't help but imagine what could happen as we moved through that dense fog for what seemed like 20 minutes. One late night around 3 a.m., I was sitting at my home on PC watching movies, playing games, etc., when I noticed him out of cigarettes. The only thing that works late at night is our local gas station, not too far from my home, but still it's easier to go with car. I took my car keys and locked my house and I went to gas station. I live in small European country, which is the most safe country on planet. Still, that doesn't mean that some bad things don't happen here and there. When you exit from a suburban area where I live, you need take right so you can take main road. After they, you just go straight for about half kilometer and then go left for another half kilometer to get to gas station. On halfway, I noticed some girl on sidewalk I usually drive slower at night cause at that time, a lot of people would speed and go on red during the night time walking faster than usual. It looked like she panicked and I noticed two guys behind her who were like 10 feet away. I bless, pointing at her and do some hand gestures towards her. They gave me a really creepy vibe. As I was getting close to girl I noticed she had scary face on like she was about to cry, but didn't cry, so I pulled over close to her and said very quietly, are you in trouble? And she just looked at me and noted with head nodding. I told her to get in car, and she did. I told her I'm going to gas station to get some cigarettes, but I will take her home as soon as I finish buying cigarettes. She thanked me for like huter times. I asked if she wanted to go to report it to police, but she said only to take her home. I went to gas station and bought me a cigarettes and bottle of water for her. She was clearly in fear. I took her home after that. We passed the same street where those two guys followed her, but those guys are never to be seen. Imagine if I didn't run out of cigarettes that night. When I was a kid, probably around 12, 13, my mom moved out to this farmhouse in the middle of nowhere. Like we couldn't get internet middle of nowhere. It was a property with 13 acres, a dilapidated barn and horse corral that had overgrown weeds, and of course the main farmhouse. At night there was no lights other than the one in the front yard to show that our electric was working. My room had a window that faced the horse corral. One night I woke up in the middle of the night, it was a full moon. I looked out my window and beside one of the fence posts of the corral, there was a girl standing there. She was wearing a nightgown and rubber boots, she was facing my window. From there things got worse. The TV we had in our basement would turn on and off randomly. My mom would hear an old radio playing in the middle of the night. My stepmom would go out to the barn to smoke. One time she was in there, she heard a girl say her name. She thought it was me, but at that time I was at my dad's house in the city. When I would wake up in the middle of the night to pee, or to get water I would feel like someone was watching me. If I looked into our living room, it felt like someone was watching me through the window. One day my stepmom and I were walking down the hallway and we both saw a nightgown go into the bathroom. No one was in there when we checked. This all came to a head when one night I woke up randomly again in the middle of the night. I used to keep my room door open and it would look out to the hallway of our house. I was laying in bed unable to fall back asleep. 
when as clear as day I heard a girl whisper my name. At first I thought it was a noise my sheets made when I moved. I tried recreating the noise, but it didn't work. Then I looked out into the hallway, and standing in my doorway was a dark figure of a girl wearing a nightgown. I stared at it, unable to move. I turned on my bedside lamp, and no one was there. It looked everything in my body to run down the hallway into my mom's room where I slept for the night. For unrelated reasons, we moved out of the house shortly after. With spooky season upon us, I decided to share a true story that happened to my mom. This is mostly anecdotal, so I will try to explain what my mom told me. When I was a teenager, my mom was a kitchen worker at a local junior high school. The school was pretty old and had many legends about deaths through the years. When she started there, the other workers would tell her stories about the school being haunted. She wasn't a believer until she encountered the most terrifying experience that shook her. The lunch period was over. They were all sitting at one of the tables having their lunch before cleaning up. Next to the main serving station was the storage closest. Inside was the cleaning supplies and it had its own spray hose to clean the floors. As they were eating their lunch, they heard the hose in the closet turn on. They quickly ran to the closet to shut it off. When they opened the door, the hose was turned on full blast and it was whipping around like crazy. One of the ladies stepped in to grab the hose. Once she stepped forward, the hose dropped in midair, turned directly towards her, and shot straight for her head. She quickly slammed the door before it hit her. They ran out so fast, completely terrified without shutting the hose off. She was crying when she got home, she was so terrified. I went there myself after to explore and also had terrifying experiences with music coming over the PAW system with the school empty. There are a lot more stories to share from that school. It has since been torn down and the school was rebuilt. I always wonder if that got rid of whatever was there or if that school is still haunted to this day. Oregon coast about three miles out from Tillamook Bay. I was on a huge sailboat with some friends when out of nowhere a smell came like you have never smelled. A thousand farting Satans could not have produced such a horrible smell. No matter where we went this dense rotting fish smell saturated the air. Well, after a few hours of this, we had enough and turned sails to head in. Well, not 400 yards due east of our heading was something large bobbing in the water. Turns out someone cast a fishing net into the ocean and wrapped up a large barrel and either a whale calf or a walrus. It was horrible. I can still taste it today. I've told this before. On a camping trip about a year ago, I woke up to a howl in the middle of the night, deep in the distance so it had an echo to it. Now this is Pennsylvania Cook Forest to be exact. I've spent a lot of time alone in the woods as a hunter, camper, hiker, and I never heard anything like this. The only thing I can attribute it to was the sound you would think a monkey howling in the jungle would sound like. We were camping near a place that had pet deer, but I know what deer sound like. This noise scared me. Three months babysitting in mansion in the middle of nowhere in renovation. I was there to keep urban explorers out the building and others. It was far removed from any kind of civilized world. The nearest small village and gas station was approximately 80 kilometers 50-ish miles away. First six weeks was fine, I was kind of bored and felt lonely at times. But I could always find things to do and or went exploring the surroundings myself. Week 8 was when I noticed some small mental changes. I had conversations with myself. Week 9-10 I began seeing things in the distance. I was sure a person was observing me from the tree line. It creeped me out I maneuvered around the house trying to sneak up the intruder and confront him. Turns out it was just a bush moving due to the wind. The weeks after I became a bit unpredictable, a roller coaster. Still haven't seen a single person. No phone line, no television. No human voices. 
I could go from euphoric to depression within an hour and vice versa. My behavior became stranger. I had trouble falling asleep. Found myself walking around drunk middle of the night's trough the woods, yelling and singing. Would you please shut the F up? We're trying to sleep here. I people? Here? Where? I located their camp. Didn't approach just yet since. They wanted to sleep, they made that perfectly clear. I only slept that night for three hours. I was so excited to have some human contact again. Six in the morning, it was getting light again, and I jumped out of bed, went to their location. They were awake, and I greeted them, went in for a talk. Surely they thought I was a bit weird, but it was just because I really missed human contact for ten weeks now. I couldn't care less who it was. Just someone to talk to that made all the difference. Week 12, I finally went home. I would never do such a thing again. Thought, ooh, well, easy money, don't have to do shit. Just babysit this luxury mansion and renovations well. It wasn't so easy after all. It's mentally rather heavy. I-17 female had a creepy encounter the night I'm writing this. My parents opened up a haunted house in my dad's shop, and we had a few actors. Names were obviously changed to their role. The actors were me, my dad, my mom, my sister, bear, ghost face, cheerleader, alien, prisoner, doll, and skeleton. I know it's a lot. Let me explain how the setup was. The shop has a store in the front, a gym in the middle, storage in the back. Dad would lead the patron into the storefront and ring the bell to let us know to get ready. Then the patron would pass Bear and Ghostface. Then they would get jump scared by cheerleader, me, and prisoner, and then pass through the rest. Alien would follow them. Simple. So when we were near the end of our time, Dad let in a guy. You know, like normal. I don't want to profile him, but he seemed to be of Arabic descent or Muslim, because he seemed to be wearing his clothes. He shall be known as Creepy Guy. I think now I should mention most of us are minors. Sister, Bear, Ghostface, and Skeleton are middle schoolers and cheerleader. Alien and I are high schoolers. Creepy Guy touch Bear's shoulder and almost pull a knife on Bear and Ghostface. After he passed them, he didn't notice cheerleader, but grabbed Alien and scratched his arm. After that, he stared at Prisoner and ignored me. He then started speaking in a different language, it sounded like chanting, but I don't know, towards skeleton, doll, and sister. Mom then ran him off. We were on edge for the rest of the night. I have three theories. Theory one. He was a druggy commonplace in my town. Theory two. He was a really religious man praying over us. Theory three. He was cursing us. I'm leaning towards two, but it was still creepy. I am a woman who goes hiking. I was on one of my regular trails and came to a fork in the road where I continue on my usual route. I'd never felt unsafe. A man around my age was there and asked if he could go the same way as me. I say yes. We talk and everything is fine until he randomly says he could overpower me at any time. Thankfully, we were near the mouth of the trail and he didn't attempt anything. I haven't gone alone since. My sisters and I were off-roading like two, three hours down a forestry road in British Columbia, Canada, before we found a good spot to camp. These roads weren't on any backroads map, so was super remote. Maybe 100, 120 K from the nearest farm or sign on civilization. Middle of night, we were still up at the campfire when my sister said she saw a red light in the bushes that quickly disappeared. She was pretty freaked, but we just laughed thinking she was messing with us. Five minutes later, I spot the red light in the bush behind her. It's a video recorder light. I turn my headlamp on in the direction of the dim red light and see a man turn and run away with camera in hand. We freak the F out, jump into the truck and drove down the narrow road without any of our camping stuff. We went back in the morning to collect. It was all still there and we surveyed a bit farther to see if there was a sort of encampment or hunting lodge. Nothing not even a walking path off the barely visible road. 
To this day, I wonder how long he followed us or what his plans with these recorded videos were for. A lone human deep in the wilderness at night is hands down the most terrifying encounter. My wife and I were hiking in Sweden and three or four days into the woods, out of the direction of population, without seeing anybody else in days. In the middle of the night we both woke up to the sound of footsteps, boots, running even sprinting towards our tent as clear as day. So I shot up, went outside the tent, and there was nobody there. Even searched around a bit in the pitch dark of the forest, but we were alone. Not that big of an outdoorsman, but I love to fish. I was out on a lake that was electric only so I was using my electric motor. It was very early, the sun was just starting to come up. I saw what looked like a beaver or a raccoon swimming towards me. It was far off maybe 100-150 yards, so I thought nothing of it and went back to my fishing. Five, ten minutes go by and I decide to move spots. I look back over and now about 20-30 feet from me was that beaver that turned out to be a black bear. I let out a scream and not a manly one. Threw on my trolling motor, which at full throttle moved me about as fast as the bear could swim. For what felt like an eternity I was being chased by a bear in the water. It was probably only a few minutes, but it scared me enough that I keep bear spray on the boat at all times. I was a sailor in the U.S. Navy for four years. During my time out at sea, I had seen some interesting things. First, I was an aviation ordnance seaman on a gun mount in the Arabian Gulf. There were two instances of two separate things that had happened. First off, which at the end doesn't end up too creepy, but I thought I'd share it anyways. While on gun mount watch from balls to four, we were watching into the sea to see several streaks of water coming towards the ship. Like these streaks reminded me of when you see torpedoes in the movies and the streaks in the water that they leave behind. Seen these through night vision goggles. Turns out they were whales. The second is pretty bizarre. So when on your balls to four watch you have to even look in the air for possible air assaults. As we are looking at the sky there seems to be a satellite or something similar looking like it was orbiting the earth. The fantail gun mount says, Mount 51, do you see that object in the sky? Looks like it's right above us. I seen it, and confirmed to the other mount that I had seen it. They told us to watch that object. About three minutes of watching this object, it speeds up and heads towards the bow of the ship, immediately changes direction and shoots towards the fantail and disappears within ten seconds. All the gun mounts were calling into the bridge about this object, freaked us out. This was maybe August of 2011. Hi everyone. Gonna start by saying I generally don't believe in the paranormal or ghosts etc. But I have been working in this school for just over a year now and my perspective is beginning to get changed. I don't know if this is the right place to tell this in. If it is not, please guide me to the correct one. I think I'll start by just explaining the school. It's based in London and is a very old school that has been here for almost 100 years. The school is massive, three floors and loads of classes or rooms, etc. So my first experience started with something completely small or insignificant, but made me think more. I am a PE teacher in the school and I was in the school for a holiday club. This means there was nobody in the school other than me and my team and the children we were working with. The children are not allowed upstairs or anywhere without us. What happened was I was outside coaching, and I looked up to the third floor, and there was papers in the room fluttering in front of the windows. Now this could obviously be explained by a draft or open window, of course. The strange thing is that at this point we had no access to the school top floors, and they are locked and alarmed the alarm will go off if any windows and doors are opened. The main thing that happened to make me think happened two days ago. I was walking upstairs to my office in the second floor. We now have access to all floors, and I heard a person whistling like full-on whistling. 
This whistling stopped as soon as I came off the stairs, and just a reminder, there is nobody in the school apart from my team, and definitely nobody on the second floor. The next thing is that I left my office and walked to the second floor staff room, which is directly across from my office, and on that walk, I heard a child laugh and giggle. There is absolutely no way any children were on the second floor, and no way I heard it was from downstairs. There has been other strange occurrences, but this is the first time I've really been unable to debunk it. My dad was on an aircraft carrier during Vietnam, and he and his buddies used to go sit against the wheels of the aircraft on deck and waste time at night. He reports there was a really bright light far off in the distance he thought was a star or planet, but all of a sudden it moved really quickly and hovered off the side of the ship next to them for a few moments. Then it took off and was completely out of sight within a second. He loves to tell the story of his UFO experience. No probes here, people, merely a very fast, bright ball of light. Edit. Now that I saw the post about ball lightning, I'm thinking that may have been it. Having my dad check out the YouTube videos to confirm. Response from my dad. Well, I watched the video and it's possible that is what we saw. It came down like a falling star with a tail on it, and then stopped about a mile above the ocean got larger and went parallel with our ship for about five or six seconds. Then it got small again like it was going straight away from us, turned right and went out of sight in a matter of a few seconds. It was like supersonic speed. This says they are usually associated with thunderstorms. Ours was on a perfectly clear night. However, we were just off of the Philippines and it was super hot and humid. You might have solved the mystery though, Thanks for the enlightenment. Love you. There are a series of events in my childhood home, mostly at night. I'll name a few. Once, I was going downstairs at around 1 a.m. Everyone was asleep except me. I woke up for a drink. I went downstairs, opened the fridge, and while I was holding the fridge open, I placed my phone with the flashlight on the table. I felt something grabbing my hand like an actual touch. I looked while I pulled away, and there was nothing there. I got incredibly scared. I was sure that my brain wasn't playing tricks or anything. I was sure. So I ran upstairs and left my phone there. Another incident was when I was much younger, also around 1 a.m. My twin sister and I were up. The door was directly facing the bed, and we were playing on her bed with the lights all out and everyone else asleep. Suddenly, the light goes on, and we see a shadow directly under the door. We thought it was our parents. Then the light goes out, and we take a slight peek with our tablets in our hands, using the flash. There was nothing there, and we didn't hear any sound of anyone leaving, or even in the house. We could also hear sounds downstairs quite a bit at night. Our parents never experienced any of this, and when we asked them about it, they never knew anything about who was downstairs. My sister could hear it too. These are the more major incidents. We don't have any signs of them anymore, but I also had quite a few nightmares. Let me start off with a few disclaimers. This isn't my story, it's a friend of my grandfather, and it's been a few years since I was told it, so the memory might be a bit hazy. It may not be scary to most people, but I thought I would share it anyway. Also, if there are any mistakes in the story, I apologize. At the time of writing this, I was getting over a concussion. This story happened in upstate New York. My grandfather's friend was hunting with one other person. For privacy reasons, I won't use any names of the people in this story. Anyway, they came across a road and decided to split up, going in opposite directions on the road. He perched himself on a rock and waited till about four in the afternoon, but nothing showed. At this time, he decided to meet up with his friend. Right when he got off the rock he was sitting on, he saw something walking in the woods across a clearing not far from him. The thing walked out of the trees, and it had its right side facing him. He didn't know if it was a bear or a person, and he didn't know whether to talk to it or not. He then decided to whistle at it. 
The thing walked away from him on two legs back into the forest. It disappeared from his sight. It then walked back out of the forest, this time facing him. They stared at each other before the thing walked back into the woods again and out of sight. My grandfather's friend walked back down the road away from the thing he saw, where he saw his friend walking up to him. He asked him if he had been down where he saw the creature. He said he never went down that way. To this day, he insists that it wasn't a bear because it would have stumbled on two legs, and he swears it wasn't a person because they would have alerted him to their presence. He insists that it was a Bigfoot. This is coming from a second-hand source, so you can judge on whether or not it's true, but I hope to find out what he saw. What I'm about to tell you is very true. I've never told anyone in my life till now. This happened to me back in 2003 at our family farm in Ohio. It was mid-October, and my dad and I were on our way to the farm to deer hunt, as we always did every weekend. We arrived there around 5.45 in the morning. We sat in the truck, talking and joking about who was going to see more deer or shoot the bigger buck like always. At about five minutes till six, we got out and got our gear on and headed towards the woods. As we entered the woods on the left side of the cow pasture, I noticed an odd, eerie feeling, which was normal for me, I guess, as the woods always gave me that feeling, even since I was young. My dad walked me to my tree stand and made sure I got in and situated safely. He told me good luck, as always, and I said I'll be back at noon. He then proceeded to his stand. A few minutes after he left, this overwhelmingly tingle came over my body, as if someone or something was watching me. At this time, it was still dark. I began to look around the surrounding timber, trying to make out silhouettes, but couldn't. I was beginning to become very overwhelmed with that feeling of eyes upon me. A few minutes had passed since I scanned the timber last. I tried once more since my eyes had now adjusted to the dark better. I looked off to my left and then slowly towards my right again and nothing. I tried to calm myself and mentally say, it's nothing, you're fine. All of a sudden, I heard crashing coming towards me from the left, and my heart sank as I looked. It was a few deer running for what appeared to be their life. They blew through the woods and didn't stop. I heard them still crashing through the timber. At this time, I was only able to make out silhouettes and outlines of trees. I thought that it was odd, but maybe a coyote or something was after them, and I just shrugged it off. Maybe five minutes later, it was still dark, but dawn approached. I then felt the hair on my neck stand up, and that eerie feeling came back upon me. My heart started to pound profusely. I heard the crunching of leaves and loud snaps of sticks from the direction the deer had run from, which was the neighbor's property on the left side of our woods. There were 100 plus acres of switchgrass and hundreds of acres of other woods. I looked up and saw what appeared to be my dad walking towards me. Daylight was starting to break now, but it was still pretty dark inside the woods. I waited for what I thought was my dad, and he got about 20 yards plus from me. I quietly said, what are you doing, dad? No response. It just continued to walk towards me. So I said a little louder, dad, what are you doing? Still no response. I began to say, hey, you know you're trespassing, buddy, but no response. As it got to the tree that my deer stand was in, I noticed that it was not my dad. I began to freak out. I looked across the woods to where my dad's tree stand was, and I saw his headlamp climbing up the tree. That's when I looked down and saw this thing standing directly underneath my tree stand, looking dead at me. Whatever it was, it was tall enough to reach up and grab my foot with ease. Mind you, I'm 14 feet up this tree. I began to start crying from fear, and my heart was beating so hard and fast, I thought it was going to explode out of my chest. I let out a wimpy, muffled, ah yell. It just grumbled at me and walked off, following the direction of the deer. I watched it disappear into the timber as the darkness was fading fast. Once it was gone, I was overwhelmed with this god-awful smell of body odor mixed with the smell of death, old hound dog, and trash. As the morning went on, the woods were dead silent. Not a bird, squirrel, or deer, nothing. 
I've never heard the woods that quiet before ever. Once I calmed down enough to climb down and out of my tree, I ran to my dad and told him I wanted to leave because I didn't feel well. So we left. This happened to me when I was 15. I'm now 29 and I've never hunted our woods in the morning again. I will not be there after dark to this day and I still have not told anyone until now. I do not smoke, drink, or do drugs. Never have. I promise this is a 100% true story and the scariest thing that's ever happened. I was staying in a cabin on the border of Pennsylvania and Maryland in the mountains. One day we were snowed in, and when you're snowed in there, you're stuck, basically. Now there are plenty of bears and deer up there. We kept salt licks, corn, and all kinds of stuff around, not to hunt, but just to feed them. Well, I walked by the back window, which is over the underground garage, where we kept the snowmobiles and four-wheelers. I see this big brownish thing in the woods, probably 50 feet from the cabin, just sitting in the snow. I was shocked because I had never really seen a bear there, but I heard the stories about them being around. So I ran to get my mom to show her. As we walked back to the window, the damn thing stood up, and I don't mean like a bear, I mean like a big tall man standing up. It then turned around and walked with a huge stride and basically took off into the woods. We stood there shocked. What the hell was that? My uncle just says, Oh, that's a Squatch. He's a celebrity around here. I don't know if he was just trying to make us feel better by diffusing the situation with a comedic remark, but after that, I never went to those woods alone again. There, that's my encounter. I am a 32-year-old female from the very northern tip of West Virginia. Most of my life has been lived in Hancock County. When I was little, we camped in tents, walked everywhere, hiked at parks, all that outside goodness. In my teens, we started going to state parks to ride horses. I've been to Tumbleson Run, Beaver Creek State Park, Salt Fork, Raccoon Creek, and Vista Park, and I think that was the name. We had a friend who was constantly inviting us to ride on people's land she had received permission from. I'm well acquainted with the local wildlife. I've seen all the major players, including koi dogs and bears, and I can identify most sounds in the forest. I love watching nature documentaries. I was looking to become a vet, so I studied a lot. Drawing and painting them got me very acquainted with animal anatomy. Was I ever into paleontology? Yes, I was a Dino crazy little girl. My one babysitter had readers digest mysteries of the unexplained. The thought of a plesiosaurus in Scotland or an apatosaurus in the Congo was just mind-blowing. Later in life, I started looking at it like folklore. It was interesting to read the accounts and learn the theories behind what people were seeing, but I believed in them as much as a forester believes in dragons and trolls. I didn't have any interest in Bigfoot, and I never heard of Dogman. I never had interest in looking, nor did the thoughts ever cross my mind. It did seem to me, though, that it seems I didn't need to go looking. They found me. We moved to the farm when I was about 10. Mom's dream was to have horses, and she was finally able to live it. The farmhouse was haunted, mainly by the former residents of the house. I never felt threatened by them, though it's a little unnerving to have two men talking and moving the couch or sitting on it, should I say, it sounded like it. No one was home, no media was on, and yet I was hearing two men talking about how they were going to move the couch and where, and the sound of the furniture being dragged right under me. The land itself had its share of strangeness. Most things were benign, though we just shrugged and carried on. I honestly hated our woods. Anywhere else I'd freely hike, but even in the yard sometimes I felt watched. Hell, sometimes I thought something was staring in our windows. Now that I think of it, we did have things slam into our trailer. I think it was a horse that had gotten loose, but when I'd go out to investigate, I wouldn't find a thing. I'd chalk it up to a deer. I used my horse's breeds for their names rather than think of names for them. Anyone who knows me knew my horse's names. I was 18 and 19 in this particular encounter, 
and by this time we gave up on cows. I hate cows and just had horses and chickens. Someone knocked at the door, and it was at 2 a.m. I'd only been asleep for two hours, but years of conditioning had my heart pumping and my mind clearing. Someone knocking that early meant trouble. It usually meant horses or livestock had gotten out. I wasn't disappointed. Our neighbors said the horses were in his yard. My mind wasn't totally awake, so I didn't think to ask which yard they were in. My stepfather came out, asked what was up, and told me they were my horses, so deal with it. Mom was working at the time, and that was nothing new. This lot of horses had three experts and escape artists. I had the routine down. It was pretty dark out, but I did have some moonlight to help. The security light only went so far. Then, of course, it shut off after some time. When it was cloudy, you could literally have to watch that you didn't walk off into the ravine. It was so pitch black. I was naturally in a foul mood, cursing my horses and wondering if some drunk had gone to the fence again. It happened a lot, believe it or not. As I got closer to the brown barn, I realized a horse was flipping out. It was running back and forth, squealing and carrying on. I went in and grabbed the halters and leads and paused for a moment to see if there was any other horse or horses that had replied to the horse I had heard squeal. That would give me an idea of where the other horse or horses might be. There was no reply, that was odd. I was thinking, crap, they're on the other side of the hill. It was the only reason in my mind they wouldn't be replying. Let's just say when they followed our cut trails to the other side, it took us an hour to traverse the woods and lead them back. Even with two guys on a four-wheeler and my mom, that was a freaky trek. I felt like I was being watched and followed. Maybe it wasn't paranoia. The land is set up like this. The brown barn was connected to a small pasture, about half an acre long, which then connects to a seven-acre pasture. Pretty much in the center, on the outside edge of a large pasture, was an old white barn that we turned into a run-in. I decided to tackle the horse still in the fence so I could bring her down to the small pasture, just to keep her from escaping maybe the others would follow. I had to walk clear to the other side of the pasture to get to the panicking horse. It was my mother's psycho horse. I tried to catch her and nearly got trampled a few times trying. She was frothing at the mouth and her eyes were really showing. Was I alarmed? No, as I said, psycho. I noticed my other six were across the road. They were standing in a tiny fenced-in area under a spotlight. They were standing motionless and not touching a blade of grass. I was wondering how the neighbor managed to herd them into that tiny fenced-in area with that tiny door. Three of those horses were over 16 hands tall. One was a draft horse cross. The doorway was actually small enough that he touched both sides going through. My thoroughbred mare took me two hours to corral, and the last time she got out, much to my frustration, she was an awesome jumper. So a stranger running them up and putting them into a tiny yard was mind-blowing. I've had horses since I was nine, and I'm 32 now. I've had ponies and horses, a couple of different Arabians, draft horses, quarter horses, walking horses, saddlebreds and other thoroughbreds and mustangs, all different kinds. I've had a lot of horses from all walks of life. I'll tell you, they consistently do not like to be crammed into tight spaces, no matter what breed it is, especially not in a group. They were just silent and dead still. My neighbor came out and told me that they were like that when he found them. He asked me if I needed any help, but I told him no. My thoroughbred and racking horse mares didn't like men. I told him I'd take them out one at a time. I took one halter and lead and threw the rest outside the gate. I put the halter on my gelding and opened the gate to lead them out. They had other plans, though. All six came out as a freaking unit. They were literally chest to butt, crammed together. My gelding and my Welsh mare had their chests pushing against me as we walked back to the brown barn. Normally, they did not do this. I wouldn't usually allow such bad behavior. We were on the main road, which I did not like. The speed limit was only 35, but people go 60 all the time. So I tried to lead them through the large pasture gate. They wouldn't even go on that side of the road, though. 
I was a little unnerved by their strange behavior, so I led them down to the brown barn and they went in. They were skittish at first though, picking at the hay I threw out, walking around relentlessly, sticking to the barn like glue and eyeing the upper pasture. I rationalized it by thinking it's the Abbey flipping out. That's unnerving them. Why hadn't she come down yet? She had to have seen us all walk down. I rushed to the gate between the little and big pastures. Out of habit, I didn't want the herd to go back out into the big pasture. I didn't have to worry. They didn't follow me like they usually did. The gate was wide open, but the abbey was still running and squealing back and forth in the same area. I started to go get her. Now the neighbor's security lights didn't really light up my pasture. The road was higher than my pasture, so it cast a shadow. I could make out her shape in some detail, though. She took off at a panicked gallop, swerved sideways, and jumped the stream. When she landed, she nearly landed on her face. She caught herself, though, and took off at a dead gallop again. I ducked behind a stump. If she would have hit me, I would have been dead. I went back and chained the gate. I decided to forego looking her over until I got the halters and leads. She was too hot at the moment. I decided to walk on the road instead of the pasture. Again, the pasture was unlit and full of springs. Sometime, though during this, clouds had taken over the sky, so there was no moonlight to be seen. The spot on the road, though, where I was at, was paved and pretty well lit. My neighbor was paranoid. I had almost gotten to the white barn when I got this sudden urge to stop and look at a very specific spot in the pasture. I'd like to say it was instinct that told me to look, but usually I'd scan the woods first to see what was watching me. That's usually where the watchers are. Instead, I just flicked on my flashlight right on a certain spot. It was extremely close to where the mare was flipping out. I saw a red eye shine. My first thought was, why in the world would a deer be there with all that chaos? I was feeling a sense of extreme dread and didn't know why besides it being where my horse was going nuts. Tix told me something else just wasn't right. I then realized where the eyes were relative to the walnut trees and my racing barrels. See, the road is above the pasture, and the walnut trees were right at the same elevation as the road. The pasture itself is sloped to deal with the runoff from the road. The barrel it was next to was on the low end of the incline. The barrels were white, so I could see a dim lighting from my flashlight on one of them. It was next to this thing. It was too freaking big to be a deer. I was frozen, standing there, watching it. I just had this feeling it was evil, and that I had to keep track of those eyes. It was watching me. It slowly blinked a few times. It also looked over into the woods above the pasture. I know you asked your guests if they ever feel there are other ones out there. Well, let me tell you, it crossed my mind with a sinking stomach. I flashed my flashlight over the woods to see if I would catch I shine. I didn't see any, though, so I went right back to the eyes. They were still there. I flicked back and forth, making sure nothing was sneaking up on me. I don't know how long I stood there watching frozen. Someone could have come around the bend and hit me with their car. I was so focused. Finally, it started to move off glancing at me sideways a few times. I think it went into the copse of trees around the creek. I heard nothing. That wasn't surprising, though. The horses were still restless and making noise. I stood there a long time after, looking for the eye shine. I was wondering if it could have been a bear. I don't think so, though. The eyes were consistent in height until it disappeared. Bears are clumsy on their back legs on this uneven inclined ground. I have no doubt a bear would have dropped to the ground to go on all fours. Even the rear up and down behavior bears do when they're trying to see something wouldn't work. We had one cross our pasture before, and he made a lot of noise going through the woods. The horses settled down quicker with the bear. I was almost to my neighbors at this point and considered leaving the couple hundred dollars of tack with them. They'd be gone in the morning, and my mom would be pissed. So I darted over and grabbed them and ran like a bat out of hell. I should have left the tack. I know you're not supposed to run, but I couldn't even conceive what I had just seen. I got to the barn, threw the tack down, and hung with the horses. 
I wasn't going to go back up that pitch black driveway on foot. I figured with the horses I'd have a warning, and the barn had plenty of sharp things. I didn't go back up until dawn. I was frozen stiff by that time. I've had years to think this over. It unnerves me that whatever it was was watching me for however long. How long was that thing there? Was that what was keeping my mare from coming down? Was it right there in the shadows while I was trying to catch her? Or was it in the unlit barn I walked through to get to the road? Was it the reason a psycho mare swerved and nearly fell? How did my horses get out? I never did find out how they got out. Did they panic and jump? I did check the fence line away from the woods, and I did look for other tracks from the barrel. Sadly, the ground was hard from frost in the morning, but I will say the Abbey mare was running for a good while, and the ground was severely torn up and turned into a muddy mess. I'll bet it was her that woke the neighbor up. To this day, I'm not quite sure what it was that I felt inexperienced. I just hope that it never comes back around my horses ever again. When I was out hunting with a friend in western Wisconsin, I didn't expect the day to take such a chilling turn. We had set out early in the morning, full of anticipation, ready to track down a few deer. The woods were serene, the air crisp, and the autumn colors of the leaves created a mesmerizing tapestry above our heads. After hours of waiting in our stand, the sun began its slow descent towards the horizon. As we watched and hoped for any sign of deer, the daylight gradually waned. We knew that our hunt was coming to an end, and we'd have to start our trek back to the cabin. The walk to our stand had been long, a mile and a half of uneven terrain and dense woods. It was tiring, especially after a day of hunting, but our excitement had kept us going. However, on our return, with darkness settling in, the forest seemed to transform into a realm of secrets, one we were intruding upon. We walked in silence, the only sounds the crunch of leaves beneath our boots and the occasional hoot of an owl. But then, as if from the depths of a nightmare, we heard it a blood-curdling scream that sent shivers down my spine. It sounded like a woman in agony, her voice twisted in terror and pain. My friend and I halted in our tracks, our flashlights scanning the darkness for the source of that wretched scream. Our hearts pounded in our chests, and we exchanged anxious glances. That scream was far from ordinary. It sent a chilling wave of dread coursing through our veins. We strained our ears, hoping to hear something that would explain the horrifying sound. But there was nothing, no rustling leaves, no footsteps, no voices, just an eerie silence that felt almost as disturbing as the scream itself. We whispered to each other, questioning what we had just heard whether it was some sort of prank or a wild animal imitating a human cry. But we both knew deep down that what we'd heard was beyond ordinary. With our flashlights trembling, we cautiously moved forward, inching our way back to the cabin. The forest that had felt like a sanctuary earlier in the day now seemed like a realm of dread, hiding its secrets in the shadows. Every snap of a twig or gust of wind sent us into high alert, as we couldn't shake the image of that chilling scream. We finally made it back to the cabin, locking the door behind us and sitting in bewildered silence. We couldn't find an explanation for what we had heard. That scream haunted our thoughts, raising questions without answers. We never did figure out what had happened that evening in the woods of western Wisconsin. The memory of that scream still lingers in the corners of my mind, a reminder of the mysteries that can be hidden deep within the wilderness. Staying at my granddad's farm in Cornwall, UK picture big fields, long narrow lanes of thick trees and bushes, are right next to massive Clifford by the sea. Just finished watching The Hound of the Baskervilles, the Sherlock episode about a massive black dog that kills people so I finish watching it about 11 p.m. in my granddad's farmhouse. Then I have to walk about one kilometer to the cottage I'm actually sleeping in. As I'm walking down the long lane with my flashlight, start thinking, if there's any place where an animal like that could exist, it's probably somewhere like here where it's so remote. 
Look up and see it's a full moon. Then as I look back down, I see two red dots in the distance rushing towards me. Two eyes. Can tell it's some animal and the eyes are like a meter off the ground so I know it's no small farm cat or something. Lost my shit and just froze. So it got to me and turns out that a family friend was visiting who has a massive boar bull, very large dog. Dog was a gentle giant thankfully because I was frozen to the spot. In an undetermined year, my stepdad resided in Virginia when he was approximately eight years old, right on the edge of the Great Dismal Swamp. According to his account, one night, when the sky was either cloudless or exceptionally bright, he hadn't considered the moon's presence until recently, he encountered a peculiar sight. Looking out of his window, he saw a creature that was staring directly at him. He described it as having spittle running down its face, with eyes locked onto his. This creature was purportedly standing on its hind legs, covered in matted fur of cream, red, and brown hues. Its facial features were notably human-like, except for its snout. It had high jawbones, a structure around its eyes, and eyes themselves that bore a striking resemblance to a human. He believed the creature's eye color to be yellow. What makes this account intriguing and potentially credible is the vast expanse of the Great Dismal Swamp a region that has remained largely untouched by humans. In recent years, researchers have begun studying the swamp's inhabitants. The swamp's environment is characterized by wet, mossy grounds that effectively absorb sound. People have been known to wander into it and vanish without a trace. The mystery of what might be concealed in this uncharted territory sends a chill down my spine. Oh, I almost forgot to mention that that night, he crawled out of his bed and sought refuge in his mother's room. In the morning, when they inspected the house, they discovered that the ground under all the windows had been disturbed, and the grass showed signs of being trampled. There were even visible scratches on the wood beneath his window, and paint was missing. Strangely, there were no discernible footprints to explain these unusual occurrences. As a park ranger, I had always felt more connected to the great outdoors than I ever did to the confines of a house. So when I decided to fully embrace the wilderness and move into the woods, it felt like a natural transition. I packed my old camping equipment and set up a small camp amidst the rustling trees and the silent whispers of nature. It was like coming home. In the beginning, everything was as it should be peaceful, serene, and full of life. However, the tranquility started to crack when I began encountering a series of strange occurrences. I found a line of dead squirrels, their small bodies lifeless and eerily arranged in a straight line. It was unsettling to say the least, but I chalked it up to some predator's strange behavior. Nighttime, however, began to bring its own set of horrors. Strange sounds echoed through the otherwise silent woods a cacophony of unsettling sounds that seemed to be getting closer with each passing night. I felt watched, my every move traced by unseen eyes in the darkness. One particular night, when the sounds seemed closer than ever, I grabbed my flashlight to investigate. However, as if in a cruel twist of fate, it flickered and died the moment I switched it on. It never worked again after that. The fifteenth day marked a shift in my wilderness experience. Beside the stream where I collected water, I discovered large, oddly shaped footprints. Unlike any animal tracks I'd seen before, these footprints sent a chill down my spine and further heightened my growing sense of dread. The nights that followed were filled with more disturbances. Whimpers and growls echoed outside my tent, growing louder with each passing night. Mornings brought a strange smell, an unfamiliar, disturbing scent that lingered around my camp. Fear started consuming me. Each night, I lay wide awake in my tent, my heart pounding in my chest, praying for sleep to take me away from the terror that gripped me. I avoided investigating the noises, the fear of what I might find far outweighed my curiosity. The climax of my ordeal came when I finally saw it a creature unlike anything I'd ever seen, lurking in the woods. 
The sight was so horrifying that it drove me to the brink of madness. I ended up in a government psychiatric facility, my mind filled with the haunting image of the creature, my words a frantic rave about my encounter in the woods. That, I suppose, is where my story as a park ranger living in the woods ends. I have a story to share with you that left me quite intrigued. It involves my neighbor and a rather unexpected visitor. It was on January 6th or 7th of this year when this incident took place, and it's something that still gives me chills when I think about it. My neighbor, an elderly woman who lives about three miles away from me near Highway 101, had a startling encounter. She recounted that Bigfoot, yes, you heard that right, Bigfoot, paid her a visit on her back porch. Now we do have quite a few bears in the area, and at first she assumed it was one of them causing the commotion. But when she went to investigate the noise, she realized it was something far more astonishing. Standing just five feet away, she caught sight of a silhouette unlike anything she had ever seen before. It wasn't a bear, she was certain of that. This figure, towering at five feet seven in height compared to her husband, had distinct features that set it apart. She was particularly struck by its large and thick neck, a feature she hadn't associated with Bigfoot before. It was an unexpected detail that caught her attention. As she observed the creature rummaging through her garbage can, she couldn't help but feel a mix of awe and curiosity. Bigfoot, right there on her porch. The encounter was both exhilarating and unsettling for her. She mentioned that she and her husband have no dogs, so there were no other distractions or explanations for what she saw. I had heard tales and legends of Bigfoot before, but this first-hand account from someone I know left me amazed. The fact that Bigfoot would venture so close to human habitation, even in our quiet neighborhood, made it all the more captivating. It made me wonder how many other extraordinary encounters might have happened in our vicinity without our knowledge. Steve, another neighbor who relayed this story to me, mentioned that sightings of Bigfoot in our area weren't unheard of. However, this particular visit to my neighbor's porch added a new layer of intrigue and speculation to the ongoing mysteries surrounding this elusive creature. As for me, I find myself walking around with a newfound sense of wonder and excitement. Who knows what other extraordinary creatures or phenomena might be lurking just beyond our backyards. It's a reminder that there are still mysteries in the world waiting to be unraveled, and I can't help but be captivated by the possibilities. I have a fascinating story to share with you, one that happened to a man named John. It was a memorable evening when he and his wife decided to spend some time at Rooster Rock State Park in Oregon, right by the majestic Columbia River. Little did they know that their peaceful fishing trip would take an unexpected turn. It was around 2 a.m., and John found himself alone at the fishing inlet while his wife peacefully slept in their tent. The full moon illuminated the surroundings, creating an eerie yet beautiful atmosphere. As he cast his line, he heard a piercing and mournful scream that seemed to come from a distance. The sound sent shivers down his spine, filling the air with an unsettling presence. Curiosity got the better of John, and he turned his gaze in the direction of the scream. To his astonishment, just ten feet away, stood a massive figure that could only be described as a ten-foot-tall Bigfoot. The creature didn't seem to pay any attention to John, its gaze fixed across the river. Rooster Rock, being known as a potential crossing point for Bigfoot, added a layer of credibility to this extraordinary encounter. As John stood frozen, he couldn't help but notice the creature's eyes. In the moonlight, they shimmered like silver dollars, eight inches apart, glowing with an intense fiery red. It was a sight that sent chills down his spine, filling him with a mix of fear and awe. Panic started to take hold of him, but then something inexplicable happened. A message of peace and non-aggression echoed in John's mind, as if telepathically communicated. It was a calming presence, urging him to maintain a sense of peace and to back away slowly. He listened to the message, turned around, collected his fishing gear, and started to retreat. The encounter had left him in a state of shock and disbelief. 
In a daze, John packed up his belongings and left in his boat, leaving his wife behind in the tent, completely unaware of what had just transpired. Later, when she woke up and discovered her husband missing, she sought help from a friend to search for him. Little did she know that John had been arrested, a consequence of the encounter's aftermath. As unbelievable as it may sound, the couple returned to the site later, driven by a need for answers. Their disbelief turned into astonishment when they discovered deep and wide tracks, measuring 17 and 20 inches in length. It was evidence that something extraordinary had indeed occurred that night. John, now eager to share his story, expressed his intention to return and recount his experiences when he finds the time. However, he chose not to disclose his last name or any contact information for verification purposes, leaving his tale to be shared solely through word of mouth. This encounter with the enigmatic Bigfoot left John and his wife forever changed, their perspective on the world forever expanded. It serves as a reminder that there are still mysteries lurking in the shadows, waiting to be explored and understood. I've been a police officer in Salem City for over 10 years now, and I've heard all sorts of strange stories from the locals. But one particular report still sends shivers down my spine whenever I think about it. It happened in the early spring of 1992, and it concerned a man named Dan and his girlfriend who were driving down Vitti Springs Road at around 10 p.m. Dan and his girlfriend were heading southwest of Salem when they saw something that they couldn't believe. A Bigfoot was standing in the middle of the road, holding a large plastic garbage bag. The creature seemed just as startled as they were and dropped the bag before running off into the darkness. Curiosity getting the better of them, the couple checked the bag and found it filled with old coffee cups. They immediately reported the sighting to the police, and the cups were turned over as evidence. The witness kept some of the cups as a gag but the rest were handed over to the museum for further study. The witness described the creature as black, standing on two legs, with ape-like features and no neck. It looked surprised when it saw them, and then squawked before running away. It was a chilling experience, and I couldn't help but wonder what other strange creatures might be lurking in the shadows of our city. I decided to check the area around where the sighting happened, and I talked to a bookkeeper at a nearby furniture store. The bookkeeper had 20 acres of land nearby and had never experienced any problems or heard anything unusual in the past. However, he did mention that he heard strange howling sounds the year before. The encounter with the Bigfoot may seem like a wild story, but I believe the couple's account. There are still so many mysteries in this world, and we have yet to uncover all of them. As for me, I will continue to keep an open mind and investigate any reports that come my way, no matter how strange they may seem. I was admitted into a peculiar psychiatric facility in Texas due to my severe depression and uncontrolled heroin addiction. The facility, an impressive castle-like structure hidden within a dense redwood forest, was financed by my well-off parents. Ever since my stay there, I've been on a relentless quest to discover the truth about this facility. My suspicions of its involvement in MK Ultra, coupled with a peculiar encounter I experienced during my stay, fuel my obsession. Despite my rigorous research, I have unearthed scant information about this enigmatic institution, save for its location and a brief article about its inauguration in the 1940s. My parents, perhaps wanting to bury the past, have remained tight-lipped about the facility, leaving me in the dark. The primary reason behind my persistent investigation lies in a disturbing encounter I had within the facility's boundaries. Despite the facility's stringent surveillance, I distinctly recall wandering into the forest at midnight, under the eerie glow of a full moon. I remember following some inexplicable presence until I reached a clearing. It was there that I saw it a towering figure, draped in shadows with a gaunt, almost skeletal figure, and skin as pale and translucent as moonlight. At first, I thought it was a hallucination, a side effect of the potent medication they had me on. But then it turned towards me, 
revealing deep-set eyes that shone a brilliant red in the moonlight. I was petrified, frozen in place by an overwhelming sense of dread that washed over me. The creature was unlike anything I'd ever seen, more akin to a Sasquatch from folklore than any animal known to man. Even now, I'm unsure if that encounter was a hallucination brought on by my medication, or if I had been an unwitting participant in some MK Ultra experiment. The memory of that eerie encounter and the creature's terrifying gaze continue to permeate my nightmares, driving my obsession to uncover the truth about the facility and what I experienced there. The encounter occurred on July 6, 2005, at about 11.30 p.m. I had a long day in San Diego, then afterward went to the beach at Del Mar, California for some surf fishing. I arrived at my home in San Marcos at about 11 p.m. After cleaning my fish and showering, I was very tired. I went out to my carport for a smoke and a look at the night sky. I looked north, thinking about a recent UFO sighting and wondering what it was all about. In the distance at a couple hundred feet, I saw a faintly visible moving object that flitted from side to side. Whatever it was, it reflected light from the streetlights. Its side to side movement was so quick, I couldn't tell if it was one object or two. The object then zipped directly over my neighbor's house across the street. By this time, I was certain I'd never seen anything like it. It continued to move side to side in a space of approximately 50 feet. It then stopped and I observed it more clearly. It may have had big eyes and wing-like appendages and was probably two to three feet in width. It remained still and I could see wavering reflections from its wings, which were not beating like a bird, but showed shimmering reflections from the streetlights. I felt the hair on my head rise all the way down my back to my ankles. It appeared to be looking at me as I smoked my cigarette. I felt threatened and said out loud, I see you. Then it went from stationary to out of sight, right over my head in an instant. I came out from under my covered carport and turned to follow its movement. Immediately, it zipped into view directly above my head, obviously studying me. I could see really weird large and intensely dark eyes. It seemed surprised by my looking right at it. It didn't like being seen. My apprehension rose even higher. It turned away and disappeared like a shot. It had a bird-like shape, but was thicker. My impression was of reflections of the streetlights on wing-like appendages and big dark eyes. It wasn't a bird, bat, or any familiar nocturnal creature. Its movements did not seem explicable in comparison to any creature that flies by beating its wings. The hills and mountains are so rugged and inaccessible near my home that anything could remain hidden and make nighttime forays at will. I read about Thunderbirds, but I'm not sure if this was one of these. Patterson, Waller County, Texas. The one my buddies and I came across on April 15 near Katy, Texas, while cutting through Morton Road between 362 and Durkin Road had amber-looking eyes. It was around 11.30 p.m. when we cut through Morton Road. We backed out of that dirt road so fast and then drove south on Durkin and then left onto Royal Road while the entire time looking over to the open field with our spotlight and the one rifle in the truck. Once we made a right onto 362 and headed south, we began feeling a bit more relaxed. We then took it all the way south to 359 and then made a left on Highway 90 and didn't stop till we made it to our friend's house in Katy. We were coming from Patterson, Texas, where one of my other friends lives. We also like to go through that patch on Morton Road during the day because it is like off-roading, and who doesn't like that? We originally thought of heading to Royal High School on Royal Road and decorating its grounds with beer cans, but we instead decided to turn left and off-road at night when we drove past Morton Road. It is the reason why we were so chilled about coming across what we thought was a large dog till it turned around and stood on two legs and growled at us. Its growl was deep, but low, it rattled the entire truck. One of my friends told me that the only thing they remember was the sound it made while breathing which was that of a horse. 
My buddy's truck is lifted and usually when I stand in front of the hood, it is around the high part of my chest, I'm 5 feet 8. But when this thing stood up, you could see most of the waist area so it had to be taller than me. I can't give an exact measurement because I just don't know. All I know is that it wasn't a bear. I've seen black bears before. The spotlight caught it and it looked like my buddy's German Shepherd and or its mulligator with amber looking eyes. Maybe it was a big koi dog or koi wolf or a bear with mange, but it was pretty tall and wide. It happened so quickly that I just... I'm having a hard time being eligible with my thoughts here. Sorry about that. So we put it in reverse and got the hell out of there and drove all the way to Katie without stopping anywhere. Then we barricaded ourselves in it with our 15s and shotguns and just sat there in the middle of the dark with our backs to each other for the rest of the night. We didn't leave the house until midday on Sunday to check the dashboard camera, which had recorded over the entire incident the previous night. Our cell phones recorded nothing but jumble and my buddy's dog wouldn't come near the truck as it kept whimpering around it with its tail behind its legs. The dashboard camera recorded over all the data on Sunday. We went through it and it was from when the truck was parked at our friend's house. The cell phone quality was so bad we erased it. I dropped my phone on the floor of the truck and didn't find it until Sunday afternoon. It is not something we were planning for like most of the videos you see on the web. Monday morning came around and we all called in sick because we refused to get out of the house until the sun was out. This obviously upset our family members' parents who thought we were being irresponsible, and we finally grew the courage to return to Morton Road on Monday afternoon. Six trucks entered Morton Road off Durkin Road with high-powered semi-assault weapons, shotguns, and hunting rifles. We didn't find any tracks either which is weird because it had rained heavily the past few days so the ground was soft and there was standing water on Morton Road. The only thing we found was this perverse stench like something had died mixed with metallic smell blood and urine ammonia. The dogs we brought with us, two German Shepherds, one Mulligator, and one Doberman were all whimpering nervously around the site like they didn't want to be there. After the incident, I have spent the rest of April just reading everything I could about dogman encounters. My other three friends don't want to talk about it either and one broke up with his girlfriend of three years because he just refused to spend the weekend hiking with her through the attic's reservoir hiking trails. They got back together after we were able to get him to open up about it. But I'm the only one that has put this on the web. It has been a month and I still refuse to be out later than sundown. I don't leave the house early in the morning anymore to go to the gym at 5 a.m. In fact, I have changed my life around completely, and that includes no more before bed walks at night with the dog. I have installed security bars on all my first floor windows, added spotlights to my entire home, and placed better security cameras. I also no longer drive through country roads even during the day, especially by myself because I feel exposed. Last week I refused to go fishing on the Brazos River and turned down heading for the weekend to Lake Conroe. I've always wanted to go fishing at the end of East Matagorda Bay, but to get there one would have to off-road on a 4x4 west from Matagorda Beach on a dirt trail for about 15 miles. Yet after this experience, I no longer feel safe. I just want to go back to being ignorant about the things that go bumping about at night. It had been a year since the hunting trip that changed my friend's life. As a former U.S. Marine, he was someone I'd always admired for his resilience and strength. So when he went missing in the wilderness, it struck fear into all of us who knew him. We were hunting in the mountains, a group of us. It was meant to be a boy's weekend, a chance to bond and let off some steam. But then he got lost. We heard his panicked voice over the radio, increasingly delirious, speaking of being pursued by a terrifying creature. He was hiding, he said, in a crevice in the mountainside, too scared to move, eat, or drink. We found him days later, severely dehydrated and in a state of extreme fear. His recovery was slow, and the trauma from his ordeal was so severe that he was admitted to a psychiatric facility. A year later, he reached out. 
I noticed he was on anti-anxiety medication and he never ventured out at night. It was clear the experience had deeply scarred him. One night, over a few drinks at his home, he finally opened up about his harrowing experience. The details were chilling. He spoke of the first night alone in the mountains, of a guttural growl that filled him with dread of feeling watched. His flashlight and radio had stopped working, leaving him blind and isolated. In his panic, he ran until he found a small crevice in the mountainside where he hid. His description of the creature was something straight out of a horror film. A seven-foot-tall, almost human figure with thin, wrongly jointed limbs. Its skin was pale, like it had been rotting, and its eyes. They were a fierce, burning red. On the second day, while the creature was absent, his radio had briefly sprung back to life, and he had been able to call for help. But after that night, he refused to confirm or deny his story. I've been researching since then, trying to understand the mystery, haunted by his tale, by the lingering smell of rotting flesh at the rescue site, and the eerie feeling of being watched. Despite the fear, there's a part of me that needs to know, that wants to understand what he went through. But sometimes, late at night, when the shadows dance on my walls, I can't help but wonder if there are some things better left unknown. The heat of the New Mexico sun beat down on me as I set off on a solitary hike, eager to explore the vast wilderness while hunting for hidden geocaches. The vast openness was a sight to behold, but the true allure was what was hidden in the wild, waiting to be discovered. After a few hours of navigating through dense foliage, I found myself in a clearing. There, I was met with a sight that seemed out of place in the serene wilderness. Half-built and crumbling concrete structures were scattered around, their skeletal frames of protruding rebar piercing the clear blue sky. A dirt road, untouched by recent rains and worn by tire treads, cut through the clearing, leading in from a direction opposite to the one I had come from. The site was oddly chilling a ghost town in the making, forsaken mid-construction and left to crumble in the otherwise untouched wilderness. Signs of recent activity footprints and freshly discarded trash hinted that the site was still frequented, adding to the eerie atmosphere. It felt post-apocalyptic, a relic of civilization left to decay among nature. Alone and unsettled by the unexpected discovery, I felt a twinge of unease crawl up my spine. The thrill of geocaching took a backseat to the creeping sense of dread permeating the area. I decided to abort my hunt, choosing to retrace my steps and leave the uncanny site behind. It was only later that I discovered the truth about the site. It was, in fact, a battleground for paintball tournaments designed to mimic an urban warfare environment. There were no signs of spent paintballs or colorful splatters on the concrete walls, leaving no clues about its real purpose. This explained the seemingly misplaced urban decay in the heart of the wilderness. Yet, knowing its purpose did little to diminish the eerie impression the site had left on me. Its incongruity with its surroundings served as a stark reminder of how jarring the hand of humanity can be amidst the beauty of nature. I was with Outward Bound in Utah for three weeks. Majority of the three weeks you are with the group, but for one, two days you go on a solo, or whatever they call it. They give you enough gear and food and plant you in a spot. You're not opposed to leave for any reason. If you have a problem, you blow the safety whistle and someone will come. We were pretty much just out of line of sight from each other in the group. So I get to my spot, set up shop and walk around my area a little bit. I then find the mangled and decayed husk of an elk, not 50 feet from my sleeping bag. It had been there for a month or two and there was barely any meat left on it, so the smell wasn't that bad. It was very clear that something had been eating the elk. The skull was three feet away from its spine, the legs were gone, and the rib cage was smashed. There aren't too many things in the wild that can do this. It could have been a black bear, but they're skittish and I could just yell at it, and it would go away. Brown bear. If it was hungry, I would be in some serious shit. Coyotes. 
Not that threatening because I am not a small dog or cat. Wolves, least likely as I don't think there are many left in Utah. Mountain lion, F me sideways if it decides to come back. Most carnivores don't want to travel great distances to hunt for food, so they stay close to their food supply. Most importantly, they don't haul the catch of the day back to the wife and kids. To my knowledge, only few animals do this. So if you find a kill of a carnivore, you are probably not too far where they live. Now sleep tight, alone, in the darkness, knowing that the animal that killed the elk isn't that far away from you. While you sleep, alone, defenseless. I grew up in the concrete jungle of Brooklyn, a place where buildings scraped the sky and cars filled the streets. My eyes had only known the grays and blues of concrete and steel, the occasional splashes of green in city parks, and the vibrant diversity of urban life. The sight of an actual forest, a densely wooded area filled with trees, was alien to me. When I was a young teen, a friend decided to introduce me to the more natural side of Brooklyn, the trails in Prospect Park. We ventured away from the hustle and bustle of the city and into the serene woodland trails. The sheer contrast was unsettling, if not terrifying. The silence was an unfamiliar melody, a far cry from the incessant city noise. The towering trees cast long, menacing shadows, making the woodland seem eerily dark and haunted. Just as I was coming to terms with the uncanny surroundings, something caught my eye that sent a chill down my spine. A white face, a girl's face, peered out from a thicket of bushes. Her eyes were wide and vacant, her mouth open in what looked like a silent scream. It was as if she was frozen in the throes of absolute terror. Instantly, all the horror stories I had heard about deserted woods flooded my mind. My heart pounded against my chest as thoughts of the worst scenarios crossed my mind had a psycho serial killer dumped a victim's body here. I stood petrified, my breath held as I tried to process the sight. It took me a good 30 seconds to realize the truth. The girl's face belonged to an inflatable sex doll, oddly discarded in the bushes. It was a bizarre sight, and though it was far from the gruesome scenario I had imagined, it still added a strange twist to my first experience with the woods. I'm a hunter of wildlife photographs, was hiking in some thick rainforest when I heard some rustling some distance away. Not loud rustling, just like something small was moving in the branches. This sound was coming from a spot that was between me and the road, and the approach is only a three, four foot wide path and thick cover on either side. I thought it was probably monkeys, but felt it would be better if I left. So I started retracing my steps, turned the last bend in the path, and now it was the home stretch. Maybe 30 more steps to the safety of the road. But there, looming right before me within touching distance, was a bull elephant looking straight at me. Lone bull elephants have a bad reputation in India. I thought I was a goner. Life flashed before my eyes, etc. He was probably puzzled too and showed his displeasure. He stomped his foot swayed his head from side to side, groaned, and crashed away through the trees on his left. I don't know why I was spared that day. Next day, in a completely different part of the forest, I was sitting under a tree, catching my breath. The forest here wasn't so thick, so I could see around me. And whoosh! Another bull elephant, but this one somehow. Can't explain, somehow didn't give me bad vibes. He appeared from 10 o'clock direction, approached to about 20-30 feet away, and then lost interest in me and proceeded to take his lunch. We spent about 10 minutes together, my heart was busting, but somehow my brain was calm and I knew nothing bad was going to happen. Nothing did. He finished eating and left. I never went into the forest alone after that. This happened when I was 16, almost 10 years ago. Me and my friend were driving around on one of our nighttime adventures. We loved just driving around the city at night and just talking. We were on a pretty busy road. 
we noticed that off the side of this road was a sudden dirt road that led off into the woods. It interested us, and this was what we considered an adventure. So what the hell, we turned onto it. This was a zone of the creepiest roads I have ever seen. Pitch black, no lights, no cell phone reception. Surrounded by thick woods, trees filled with cobwebs, and there were clothes thrown around everywhere. You wouldn't think that you were in the middle of a city. It was weird from the start. As we're driving down the road, there's this small cliff with large, strange black sculptures on top of it. One was a giant cube, balancing on one corner, that looked like it had faces carved into it. Another was more two-dimensional, about 12 or so feet tall with no features, but kind of looked like a twisted human with missing limbs. This small cliff had a gravel road next to it. We drove up it, and there's a large metal building with multiple rusted metal doors. Those kind you pull up to open. I immediately looked at my friend and said, this is a weird as shit building. I wonder why it's here. She said, I don't know, but we need to leave now. This feels bad, and there's cameras everywhere. She pointed them out, and sure enough, there were cameras literally embedded into the trees. You could see the lenses sticking out of the trunks. We pulled up just a little bit to turn around. We parked right there on the side of the road, once we got off the gravel one. We were debating on whether it was safe to get out and take some pictures. Just as we figured it was best to come back in the morning. Suddenly, about five dudes appeared out of nowhere. They had the car surrounded and were screaming and beating on the car and windows. I'm not sure what they were yelling about. I heard one of them mention something about a basement. I thought he said, you drove over our basement. As we're looking around and at each other like, what the F is going on and what do we do? The dude in front of us picks up a massive rock and looks like he's getting ready to chuck it through the windshield. She throws the car into reverse and floors it. This road is narrow, so she practically drives in reverse the whole way down, and we hit the main road and begin driving down it. I'll never forget as I turned around and watched a green pickup truck with blue headlights peel out onto the road off that street. I turned to her and yelled, Dude, they're following us. We drove through all sorts of places, gas station parking lots, back roads. This truck followed us through every single one. After about 20 minutes, her instinct was to go home. I knew better. I told her if someone is chasing you in a car, never go home. You don't want them knowing where you live. I told her to drive until she lost them or go to the police station. She didn't want me to call the police or to really even have to deal with the police yet. So we kept driving, driving fast and taking as many turns as possible. Eventually we entered the highway and just kept driving on it. We finally lost them in between all the cars and got off on an exit. They kept driving straight. They chased us for almost two hours. It was insane. We would talk about it every now and then, wondering what that place was or what they wanted. We'd also bring up the basement thing and wonder if that's what they said. And if so, who's stupid enough to build a basement underneath a driveway? Or what kind of psychopath has a secret basement in the middle of the woods? Sometimes we'd contemplate going back, but quickly decide it was a stupid idea. Never been back since. But ten years later, I'm still curious about the place. In early February, an intriguing tip came my way hinting at a series of astonishing encounters with none other than Bigfoot in Elk County. Eager to delve deeper into this mysterious phenomenon, I seized the opportunity to interview two witnesses who had experienced firsthand the presence of the elusive creature. What I uncovered during those conversations left me both astounded and captivated. One resident, who wished to remain anonymous, shared a remarkable account with me. He revealed that he had been actively placing scrap buckets filled with an assortment of food apples, berries, and corn near the edges of the woods, hoping to provide a feast for the local wildlife. Little did he know that his generous act would soon lead to an encounter he would never forget. On the fateful evening of his encounter, the resident found himself in his cozy home, 
enveloped by the tranquility of the surrounding forest. Suddenly, a distant sound of heavy, thunderous footfalls pierced the stillness, causing his curiosity to awaken. Recognizing that the rhythm and weight of those steps did not match the gait of an elk or deer, a sense of intrigue mingled with a touch of apprehension settled within him. A few minutes later, his outside security system alerted him to movement near the vicinity of his property. With a mix of anticipation and trepidation, he peered out of a nearby window, straining his eyes to discern the source of the commotion. What he witnessed next defied all logic and reason. Standing before him was a colossal figure, towering between eight to nine feet in height. Its entire form was enveloped in a thick cloak of black and gray hair, rendering its true features partially concealed. The creature's imposing stature was such that the window frame itself obscured its head from view. The witness's heart raced, and a sense of awe washed over him, realizing he was in the presence of something truly extraordinary. The creature possessed an immense wingspan, its shoulders broad and robust. Its long arms swung rhythmically with each calculated stride, a testament to its untamed power. With measured grace, it moved away from the property, disappearing into the depths of the surrounding woods. The witness stood transfixed, the weight of the encounter settling upon him, forever etching this remarkable sight into the depths of his memory. I'm a born and raised Long Islander. So are my parents. They met out east, which in Islander talk means the east end of the island. To any NYC rich kids, that means the Hamptons. But for the rest of us who are coincidentally not millionaires, it means the North Fork. Not to get too geographically confusing, but Long Island is an accurately named Long Island that forks off about a three quarters of the way down the 90 miles it stretches. It kind of looks like a fish with its mouth open, with the North Fork being where the eyes are and the Hamptons are the jaw. Shelter Island is somewhere in the middle, like a smaller fish about to be eaten. My mom's family had a summer house on the North Fork. My dad had a house on Shelter Island. My parents met working at a summer job, and the rest is clearly history. But super long explanation short, I grew up getting to pretend to be Baoji, because I had not one, but two summer houses. I know, right? Shelter Island is my favorite place. In a lot of ways, just the island itself feels magical. The only access is by ferry, and while traveling there you feel like you are being transported into a different world. But the picture of Shelter Island in the summer is very other than the winter. In the summer, the population rises to around 20,000 people, but in the winter, not more than 2,000, so I was around 13 or 14. I had invited my best friend to come out with my family that weekend. I was so excited, as it was one of the first times she was able to. I remember our bathroom was being renovated, and so the only other bathroom we could use was in the dank, dark basement, and the only connection to the house was by going outside and down the stairs, and then down another set of stairs into the basement. So it had to have been around 10 o'clock, and we went together to the bathroom to brush our teeth. The moon was almost full, so bright it provided some lights on an island that street lamps were few and far between. If it wasn't for the light of the moon, we probably would have passed the creature altogether without realizing it, because out there you can hardly see two feet in front of you when it's dark. As we were coming back up the stairs, laughing about something menial was when we saw it. It was about 10 feet away, with its back to us, lurking near my shed. We both froze and did that thing where you take a quick breath and hold it involuntarily. That made the creature notice us. Its head whipped around, and his eyes were glowing, a kind of blood red. It didn't look angry, but rather like a feral dog, not knowing how to react to these two teen girls observing it. Almost as if not to scare us, it slowly rose up to full size, which I would guess was around seven feet. The whole time, it never broke eye contact. I felt I could fall into the pits of blood that its eyes were. It was covered in long, shaggy black hair and had thick human-like legs. After standing there, frozen in horror, for at least a full minute, 
All the while still in this staring contest, we both regained control of our feet and ran up the stairs screaming for my parents. We saw a werewolf, we saw a werewolf. My dad went out first and we followed. My dad quickly dismissed it and went back inside, a bit disgruntled. I could have sworn I saw a bush where it was near move. Over the years I've had many theories, one of which is that the native people who lived on the island before the white man are responsible, as shapeshifting legends are prevalent in indigenous people's cultures. Maybe it's the descendants of the people who stole this land, cursed to turn under the full moon, choosing isolation to protect their secret. For nine months out of the twelve anyway. I remember the day as clear as a bell. My girlfriend and I, hungry for adventure, decided to take on the Appalachian Trail. We weren't through hikers by any means, just a pair of carefree spirits looking to experience the rustic charm of the wild over a three-month period. We were far from civilization, hadn't seen a soul in what seemed like forever. The isolation was just as we desired it, an escape from the urban frenzy. As I led the way, my eyes caught sight of something peculiar. It was a large brass eagle, strangely abandoned on a tree stump. We were miles into the wilderness, the nearest town a distant memory. The weight of the eagle spoke of its authenticity. It was a random token of human civilization in the midst of untouched nature. It seemed to be the first in a series of unusual items we encountered that day, each one more inexplicable than the last, discarded as if part of a breadcrumb trail. That evening, we arrived at a shelter. Our relief at finding a place to rest was quickly overshadowed by the unsettling presence of the shelter's lone inhabitant. He was an old man, his disheveled appearance and his walking staff topped with a baby doll's head gave off an immediate eerie aura. With only two levels in the shelter, we opted for the top, leaving the ground floor to our disconcerting company. The night was long. Any attempts at sleep were interrupted by the old man's rambling tales from his past. He spoke of his days as a cab driver in New Orleans, his voice echoing through the wooden shelter. His stories took an uncomfortable turn when he reminisced about passengers engaging in intimate acts in the back of his cab and how he would watch them in the rearview mirror. It was a disturbing disclosure that hung in the air like a bad stench. At dawn, we couldn't wait to distance ourselves from the shelter and its eerie resident. Before leaving, we left him some power bars his haggard appearance suggested he needed them more than us. He probably had schizophrenia or some other mental illness, I thought, as we quickly retreated down the trail. Our encounter with him was a chilling reminder that the wilderness wasn't just filled with physical challenges, but with mental ones too. It was a usual day in Missoula, Montana, the sort of day that begged you to lace up your hiking boots and lose yourself in the majesty of the surrounding mountains. I lived in a house tucked away at the foot of these ranges and found solace in their imposing shadow. After perhaps 45 minutes of arduous uphill hiking, without a path to guide me, I stumbled upon something that broke the rhythm of nature's harmony. It was a cage, but not one designed for trapping or hunting. No, this one was large enough to contain five to ten average-sized people standing erect. The structure was constructed with round steel bars defining its edges. The walls and ceiling were crafted from robust ropes instead of conventional chain links. It was cleverly concealed, resting just on the far side of the ridgeline, invisible to anyone who wasn't directly upon it. The isolation of the cage was both puzzling and unnerving. Looking around, I noticed the ground was undisturbed, no footprints, no tire tracks, no signs of recent activity. The cage seemed oddly pristine, the ropes intact and undamaged. It was as if this cage had appeared out of thin air, serving an unfathomable purpose in the heart of this vast wilderness. A chill of apprehension ran down my spine as I studied the eerie structure. I felt a primal instinct kick in urging me to leave the area and distance myself from this unsettling discovery. I had stumbled upon a mystery that, perhaps, was best left unsolved. 
Regretfully, I didn't have a camera with me that day. This was two years ago, and I was only out for a day hike. Over time, the memory of that cage has only become more enigmatic, a strange enigma amidst the natural beauty of the Missoula Mountains, a story that I now share with a sense of bewildered unease. Dimly lit, cluttered with scientific equipment and specimen containers, the remote Iraqi lab is an eerie and foreboding place. The sound of machinery hums in the background. A group of scientists, huddled together in lab coats, move with purpose around a large glass enclosure in the center of the room. Inside the enclosure is a bizarre creature, resembling a hybrid between a wolf and a reptile. Dr. Hassan, a middle-aged scientist with graying hair, observes the creature intently, a mix of excitement and trepidation in his eyes. We've done it. The perfect specimen. Our own creation. Dr. Ali, a younger scientist with an air of uncertainty, approaches Dr. Hassan, casting a worried glance at the creature. But what if something goes wrong? What if it gets out? Hassan waves off Dr. Ali's concerns dismissively. We have taken every precaution, my dear Ali. Our creation will be contained within these walls. Suddenly, an alarm blares. Flashing red lights fill the room. Panic ensues. What's happening? said Hassan. Dr. Ali frantically replied, It's escaped. The creature has breached containment. The scientists scramble, desperately trying to regain control. The creature, now free, prowls the lab with a savage and calculated intent. What have we unleashed? One by one, the scientists become prey to the unstoppable creature. It lunges, claws, and tears through their bodies, leaving a trail of carnage in its wake. The lab descends into chaos as screams of pain and terror echo through the air. A few days later, in the blistering heat of the al Hajra desert in Iraq, beads of sweat glistened on my forehead as I, Jocko King, led my highly trained Navy SEAL team on Operation Mirage. Our mission was to infiltrate a suspicious research facility in Iraq, rumored to be a covert weapons development site. The stakes were high, and failure was not an option. As we trekked through the unforgiving desert, our bodies pushed to the limits by the scorching sun, we remained vigilant, aware of the hostile Iraqi forces that could be lurking in the shadows. Our camouflaged gear provided little relief from the relentless heat, but we pressed on, knowing that the fate of many lives depended on our success. Finally, we arrived at the facility, its nondescript exterior belying the secrets hidden within. With calculated precision, we breached the compound, ready to face whatever lay ahead. To our astonishment, the facility appeared deserted, devoid of any human presence. Confusion gnawed at our minds as we cautiously proceeded, scanning our surroundings for any signs of life. Then the unnerving truth revealed itself. Littering the corridors were the lifeless bodies of over a hundred scientists and doctors, their vacant stares forever frozen in a haunting tableau. The silence was oppressive, as if the air itself held its breath in anticipation. We couldn't fathom the horrors that had unfolded within these walls, but we had little time to dwell on it. Suddenly, a chilling growl resonated through the empty halls. We snapped into high alert, our senses heightened, ready to face any adversary that dared to challenge us. Emerging from the shadows was a creature beyond our wildest imagination, a cryptid, resembling a hulking Bigfoot with fur that blended seamlessly with the desert sands and razor-sharp black talons reminiscent of an eagle's claws. Fear coursed through our veins, but we had been trained to face the unknown, to confront danger head-on. The cryptid lunged at us with a ferocity that matched its monstrous appearance. It moved with unnatural speed, leaving us scrambling to defend ourselves. In the chaos, it claimed the lives of a few of my fellow seals, their sacrifice etching a permanent ache in my heart. Yet, we refused to surrender. We fought back with every ounce of strength and skill we possessed. Bullets pierced the creature's flesh, and the deafening blasts of gunfire reverberated through the facility. Our determination proved unwavering, even as exhaustion threatened to consume us. And finally, we succeeded in bringing down the cryptid, 
its monstrous form collapsing in a heap before us. As the creature took its last breath, an inexplicable phenomenon occurred. Its lifeless body disintegrated into a swirling mist, dissipating into the air as if it had never existed. The implications of this encounter were far-reaching, and our minds spun with questions that remained unanswered. Inside the facility, we established contact with the nearest us military base, informing them of our triumph over the conquered facility. Our voices trembled with a mixture of relief, exhaustion, and a lingering sense of unease. We had accomplished our mission, but the memory of that cryptid, the horror we had witnessed, would forever haunt our dreams. I served in the SAF as a combat medic and was tasked to lead a medical support team for a training course in Brunei. Due to one of my medics falling sick out in the field, I had the privilege of taking his place and spending the night with an officer and a warrant officer W.O. on a narrow ridgeline in Mount Biang, which was apparently a navigation exercise checkpoint for the trainees. As night fell, we were warned by the officer to refrain from sleeping in the middle of the ridgeline as we ran the risk obstructing the path of any wandering spirits. Out of respect, we took the advice and constructed our hammocks as close to the sides of the ridgeline as we dared. Being a light sleeper, I kept being roused by the sound of the occasional heavy footstep walking by, crunching on the dead leaves and sticks on the ground. The footsteps sounded human, but at that point of time at night, nobody was supposed to navigate the mountain in pitch black. The next morning, my auditory experience was validated when all three of us found fresh tracks, too big to belong to any animal, on the ground that appeared in inconsistent intervals. I was walking through the vast field, my footsteps crunching on the dry grass beneath my boots. The sun was setting, casting an orange glow across the landscape. As a park ranger, I had spent countless hours patrolling these woods, ensuring the safety of both the visitors and the wildlife that called this place home. I had a routine, a familiar path I followed every evening. But this time, something felt off. The air was thick with an eerie silence, broken only by the distant chirping of birds. As I approached the tree line, a sense of unease settled upon me, like a shiver running down my spine. And then it happened. A bone-chilling, raptor-like scream pierced through the air, cutting through the tranquility of the evening. The sound reverberated through the trees, resonating deep within me. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest, my senses heightened. I stood there immobile for what felt like an eternity. The seconds stretched into minutes, and my mind raced with a whirlwind of possibilities. Was it a wild animal? a prankster playing tricks on me, or something else entirely. With trembling hands, I reached for my shotgun, fingers fumbling as I loaded a shell into the chamber. The weight of the weapon provided some semblance of comfort, a small assurance in the face of the unknown. I slowly made my way to a nearby towering tree, its ancient branches reaching out like skeletal fingers against the fading light. Leaning my back against its sturdy trunk, I sat down, my eyes scanning the surrounding area, searching for any signs of movement or danger. But there was nothing. The woods remained still, devoid of life. The only sounds now were the soft whispers of the wind and the rustling leaves. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that unseen eyes were trained on me from the shadows. Time ticked by, the minutes merging into an indefinite stretch of apprehension. The night gradually enveloped the land, casting an impenetrable darkness upon the trees. Still, I remained alert and vigilant. Hours passed, and the moon cast its faint glow over the landscape. No more screams, no more unsettling noises disrupted the calm. With a mix of relief and curiosity, I cautiously rose from my spot and continued my patrol. As I made my way back through the field, a nagging sense of unease lingered within me. I couldn't shake the feeling that whatever had emitted that bone-chilling scream was still out there, lurking in the shadows. But for now, all I could do was carry on, my footsteps echoing through the night, 
and hoped that tomorrow would bring answers to the mystery that had unfolded in the woods. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.